here is local cross-link and there are entanglements because if the polymers are long, they're entangled together. So uh, what we are looking at it, entanglements, if you have long object entanglements are inevitable. We are looking at a situation where the polymer chains are so long between two cross links <laughs> so that there are many, many more entanglements in between. How many more? 100 to one. I'll show you numbers, uh, experimental, lots of entanglements. So confused. Why this material is interesting to us? That's uh, uh, the, the talk today. We have a sequence of work uh, uh, devoted to this uh, in hindsight. In the beginning, we, we didn't know what we were doing. So we start with something uh, we were looking at uh, a little over 10 years ago about a fracture and the fatigue of a polymer network. So here is a work we had uh, in the beginning. We made a material, I'll show you the molecular structure shortly. It uh, consists of two kinds of polymer called alginate and a polyacrylamide. It's a hydrogel. Uh, I'll show you the structure shortly. Uh, but mainly this material has enormous toughness. Toughness means uh, a material property that resists growth of a crack. Now let's uh, take a look at this material. So the material is transparent. Uh, you see the black background. So here's a piece of material. We can stretch this material uh, 21 times, very stretchable material without a crack. Now, if you put a crack in the material, you can stretch 17 times. This crack become big hole. The crack does not propagate. So this is a property we say tough. So we have a way to convert this into a number called a toughness. You, if you really want to know how to measure toughness, Michael Thalas is a teaching a course. Right? So if you still don't understand it, Michael Thalas <laughs> is to blame. We measure toughness. Uh, so this number is high. Why do we say it's high? You know, you know people have an idea about a tofu and a jello, 10 joule per meter square. We're tough, right? And uh, uh, most gels, um, so 10, a contact lenses, which requires some mechanical, you need to handle it. A uh, hundred joule per meter squared cartilage of human beings, one thousand. Natural rubber, gold standard, ten thousand. So we're comparable to ten thousand with ninety percent water. Only ten percent is a polymer. It's a, yeah, quite amazing material. The paper made to science, uh, no, no, nature in this case. Uh, we were extremely proud of this material. Extreme proud. Yeah. So now this is a, a physical picture of what happens. Yeah, Michael Thales will explain this mechanism as well. Um, so this material, as I mentioned, there are two ingredients, polyacrylamide. Polyacrylamide is just a long chain polymer. Long chain polymer, you can see this chain has some uh, uh, wiggling in it, just like noodle. Uh, in between chains are, are uh, water, a lot of water molecules. So it's a hydrogel. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> hydrogel. Uh, right. And we're talking about uh, 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 resistance to crack growth. Here's a crack. If you stretch this material, a uh, crack advances by breaking polymer chains. So the ability to uh, resist this crack growth or how high the load it is is a measurement of a toughness. We have a way to convert this number. So for this part of chromite, it's on the order of 100 joule per meter squared. So I'll quote this kind of numbers. So by the end, you will have some sense uh, what what these number means. For example, here is a, a seaweed material called alginate, alginate seaweed material. Uh, it is, oh, incidentally, this is a polymer network with a covalent cross link. Oh. Excuse me. Uh, now, this material, uh, seaweed material, is crosslinked by calcium ions. It's a biological material, calcium ions. So, uh, when this crack propagate through the material, it doesn't break any chains. It unzip a calcium crosslink, ionic crosslink. This material really like tofu, 10 joule per meter squared. So, you have sense of 10 joule per meter squared, it's tofu, tofu material. Now, 
these two materials both are fairly brittle, low toughness material uh, uh, in combination at a molecular scale uh, reach high toughness. I guess at that point, uh, people were very excited about it, but for somebody like a, a you know a fracture expert like a Wei Lu and uh, and uh, and uh, and my friend thought is ah as this, we know about this you can do this black magic or black algebra of algebra uh, of a brittle material plus another brittle material become a tough material. So I won't bore you about their knowledge, their private knowledge. Let's take this as a. Uh, magic. Let me explain this magic to you. So the magic is very simple. It's actually a profound lesson, not created by me. Uh, this uh, material is created by our group, but uh, the knowledge itself had some history to it. Here's the idea. Now, uh, for this material, come back again. Uh, when crack going through, uh, this material is very elastic, like rubber, very elastic material. So the crack grows through it means you break one layer of uh, uh, polymer chains. Just a break, for each chain, you only need to break one at a time about, right? So for this crack to grow uh, through, you only need to unzip one layer of a calcium bond. In both cases, all these other material away from the crack is elastic, does not dissipate energy, however, if you put these two materials together, uh, so here you can still see this uh, 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 this uh, polyacrylamide and this alginate. So because the polyacrylamide is here, it induces a high stress over large volume of material. So many of these uh, uh, calcium uh, uh, zip are unzipped. How large volume? Volume extend to centimeters. Here is, it's, you know, 10 nanometers, it's, you know, uh, here's a centimeter. Of course you are much tougher, right? So that is the idea. So uh, that's how a two brittle material can, 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 can give a child of a tough material. All right, so that, of course, we're extremely uh, proud of this paper. This paper is extremely well cited. Uh, so, uh, okay, but there's one thing, the experiment we avoid to do because we know it will be bad. It is uh, under cyclic loading. Most application of engineering material uh, will have cyclic loading. It's called fatigue, fatigue. So, so the way to characterize fatigue, again, this is an old way of to characterize it. We adopted it. So you, you have this material. Uh, it could be metal, could be hydrogel in this case. You cut a crack in the material and then doing cyclic loading. So the uh, magnitude loading is uh, represented again by this unit joule per meter squared on energy release rate. So you can do lower. Remember the toughness is uh, way over there. It's a 10,000, so not off the chart. Very, very tough material. However, if you uh, do a very low loading, uh, the crack, this is C, the crack length, will grow cycle by cycle. This is a micrometer per cycle. Micrometer actually is a very large extension. If you go thousand cycles, it's one millimeter already, right? So, so uh, okay, um, here, let's say you uh, applied load is 160 joule per meter square. It really, this G is a calibrated from the applied load, the amplitude applied load. Oh. What's the purpose of this discussion? Just amplitude or applied load. Good. So if you have a 160 applied load, you have this amount of growth per cycle, maybe 2 at 2.5 uh, micron per cycle. If you lower the load, you uh, each cycle grow smaller. And if lower further, uh, the growth per cycle is even smaller. There is a load. It's about a 50 joule per meter squared. Before this, below this load, the crack doesn't grow. So this is a called threshold. Yeah, this name should, uh, yeah, the name here, threshold. We were terribly disappointed. There are friends of Robin. Robin, once he found this result, oh, I cannot graduate, come on. <laughs> So you claim previously with this a fan fire or of a, of a thousand, 10,000 joule per meter toughness. 
Who uses the material only one cycle? <laughs> Maybe only at Harvard, right? Real this place uh, in Michigan, you do many cycles, right? You use a car, you use, all uh, right. Even contact lenses, you have many cycles. Uh, the, um, the crack will grow at uh, the moment that you reach 50 joule per meter square. Orders magnitude are lower. The threshold is much lower than toughness. For engineering applicants, most applications, you don't really care about toughness. You care about the fat fatigue threshold. So for people who took engineering courses about a fatigue, it's a horrible engineering problem. Very tiring, it's a fatigue problem, right? But in lectures, it's very simple. You don't have much to say. You spend a half lecture, you move on. <laughs> fatigue is not very important, but unsolved problem, let's move on. <laughs> I know, I, I, the, the universal, the whole, 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 yeah, whole, whole, whole world is teaching that way. I taught that way too. I don't think uh, 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 yeah, uh, Michael would do anything better. So the shorter, uh, uh, the better, because you don't, really don't have much to say. But recently, just in recent since this work, we really opened up a box. We can design the material such that the threshold reach thousand per meter square. And we know what's happening. That has something to do with the tangle. So this is a story I want to tell you. Okay, so that's a fatigue and a fracture. Uh, now, now, one thing, uh, uh, so uh, this is for people learn something about uh, the uh, uh, toughness. It's this a plasticity, hysteresis, unzip, right? Unzip lead to hysteresis. Hysteresis means uh, if you load it up, you unzip. Uh, you require high force to unzip. But when you unload, the structure is already unzipped. The material becomes softer. So loading up, stress strain curve, loading down, they're very different. In between, that's his reasons. So it's known for many years for metals, for example, uh, his races enhance toughness because uh, his race is dissipated energy. So, and uh, these gentlemen, Lake and Thomas uh, remarked, it's also known for many materials, his races will amplify toughness, but not fatigue threshold. So for example, they have experiment data to show by varying uh, amount of his races. So this is a growth per cycle, and this is applied load. It's another way called energy release rate. It's the same G. Uh, you always go back to, for their, this is natural rubber, uh, to a threshold about a 50 joule per meter squared. But it depends on the type of polymer. You can have a, a high hysteresis, a low hysteresis. Your toughness could be very large, could be very small. It doesn't matter. Toughness is, uh, is easy to modify but a threshold is extremely hard to modify, 50. So that number was measured, first measured around 1958, first paper. Uh, that ha this number has almost stayed unchanged for decades until we made discovery. Uh, I'm, I'm serious, we're extremely proud of this. So, uh, all right, uh, so this is a story I want to tell you about, okay. Uh, so uh, next thing, uh, as a, another preparation is, uh, as a, it's a, called a stiffness a threshold conflict. There is a conflict in polymer. So let me explain what it, is this idea is. So uh, again, uh, come back to the late Thomas uh, uh, picture. So you ask, uh, what is, uh, why 50 joule per meter square? Where, where does this 50 come from? So they came up with an idea as the following. Uh, so here's a crack coming along. So we said, uh, in order for crack to extend, all you need to do is break single atomic bond for each chain. You break this chain, then break that chain, but each chain, you break single atomic bond. However, before you break this bond, the entire chain is under high tension. When you break this bond, the energy of the entire chain is lost. So even though you break only one bond, the energy you dissipated is stored in the entire chain. Okay, so here's a little calculation. There's, oh, so threshold, 
is energy per volume. This is energy. Um, uh, this is energy per bond. This volume is a per volume of each bond. So this is energy per bond times the length scale. The length scale is uh, it's a, essentially it's a it's a length uh, between uh, uh, one crosslink to another crosslink because uh, uh, it's a random walk in the beginning. B is uh, the monomer length, and N is a number of uh, repeat units. A uh, square root is because you are doing random walk. So it's a length scale times energy per volume. That gives you a threshold. So if you put typical numbers, that gives you about 50 joule per meter square. That's how it comes about, 50 joule per meter square. In particular, now I'll repeat this point later, uh, but uh, let's point out this uh, uh, once again. I said in words so many times, I don't have a lot of messages. I have one message I'll repeat three times <laughs> because it's important. Uh, all right, so uh, this is uh, 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 the energy per uh, unit volume. This is U is energy of a, a bound, but you really need to dissipate energy of an entire chain. So therefore, there is this length scale associated with a chain length in a relaxed configuration. This situation is a very different. This is a polymer. This lens is a very much larger than the lens of individual atomic spacing. Individual atomic spacing is B, right? N could be 100, 1,000 repeating units, right? So that's very different. It's a, for example, it's different from window glass. In window glass, there's no polymer chain. So N is practically equal to one, right? So I'll come back to this point. I just rest here. All right, so this is wonderful. Well, then you say, okay, wonderful. Uh, if I want to make this material have a high threshold, obviously I cannot change bond. This is a carbon common bond, it's a universal. Why is it universal? There's this world, this terrible world, miserable world, only have one type of electron. Well, all covalent bonds, just one electron, or two electrons. Terrible, I cannot modify that. Uh, so, uh, so all these numbers you essentially cannot modify. The only number you can modify is how many you repeat units you can have. 100, 1,000, 10,000, 1 million. What limit is that? How about 10 million? How about 1 billion? Do I get really, really high fatigue threshold material? The answer is yes. You have a problem. The problem is the following. It's a problem we now name it's a stiffness threshold problem. The problem is that if you make chain very long, the material becomes very soft. Alan Aruda was a pioneer. There is a, na uh, a model named after her. <laughs> Aruda Boys model. I don't, I don't know if you remember. I have a photo with Aruda here. And the boys here, Ashi Gansu is in the middle. <laughs> there's, there's a photo. A Rusa Boys model uh, about the stiffness and uh, the stress string curve. So it's well known in the field uh, that uh, stiffness, yeah, in particular, it's actually the scaling is a list here. The modulus, Young's modulus, for example, scale with one over n, n being how many repeat units. <laughs> If N is very large, you can sense that as the material becomes floppy, not useful. The tires become tofu, uh, tofu become <laughs> come, come soup. It's just it's hopeless. <laughs> hopeless. Uh, so N cannot be uh, too large. Typically, maybe 100, maybe 100 or so repeat units. Uh, so, all right. Uh, now, if N is a small, now we know, we just learned. If N is a small, you don't dissipate much energy. Threshold is low. So there is a conflict, right? So, uh, and uh, uh, we, we test the experimental uh, value. So these are other people's value for elastomer. For hydrogel, it's here. So the main point is uh, this is a threshold. Uh, if a threshold is high, your modulus will be low. If a modulus is high, the threshold will be low because they're inversely correlated through the number of repeat units. It's a, it's a physics. It's Greg. It's a physics. It's a physics. All right. Uh, it's not a fiction. Okay. So um, yeah, that was that. <laughs> now then, 
we uh, around that time, actually before our work for people in polymer uh, hydrogel development, uh, yeah, in, yeah, great development by uh, Jian Ping Gong, Jian Ping Gong uh, in, in Japan. Uh, she developed this double network hydrogel. Uh, they have two networks, a blue network and red network. Red network has a long chain, blue network has a short chain. So this network, she showed has enormous toughness. So uh, her toughness is a thousand joule per meter square. And we developed material 10,000 joule per meter square. So our paper got published in Nature, of course. So but she was more original, or more original. She did before us. <laughs> anyway, so we said, uh -huh. there's another material. We learned how to prepare this material. She did not test the fatigue property. Well, okay, in the world, there are two great materials. Our material was a horrible fatigue, right? 50, maybe her material is better. Let's test her material. I was praying her material will also be terrible. <laughs> but her material was a spectacular. This is the experimental data. It's our data uh, using her materials. It's the same recipe. So you can see the threshold is a several hundred true per meter square. We didn't understand at that point. What's going on? The students must be wrong. How, how about Xi Yongsuo's material is terrible? Jian Pingong's material is so good. There is some, some mistake. There was no mistake. Eventually, we understood what is going on. And this is an important lesson for us to develop. The lesson is actually very simple. She has two networks. Uh, so uh, we already learned for single network, there is this, this conflict because uh, you cannot get in too large or too small, right? You, you hit one thing. However, if you two network, your modulus is, uh, you have two networks called A and B. As A is this uh, short chain network, you can use short chain network to be responsible for modulus. You get modulus very high by using short chain. That's good. And uh, uh, for, uh, for uh, threshold, you use another long chain. Of course, you have a, right? So you just need to have two kinds of chains. One short, one long, you can have both. Good. So whenever there's a conflict, the concept, there must be a theorem. Polymer or Luna is a department head. So she must know this. Whenever you have a conflict, instead of resolving the conflict, you add resources. The conflict has disappeared. <laughs> you add a different kind of chain. You, 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 you. All right. So uh, then we uh, tested our numbers, or uh, actually her material. We measure it uh, for the first time. The threshold is so high, hundreds. Uh, so yeah, you can see. Uh, yeah, we, we just showed you hundreds of joule per meter squared, and our hydrogel or her hydrogel has a toughness comparable to elastomer with about 90% water. It's just, 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 just terrific. And we, on top of that, we understand it's not hard. All you need to do is just make chain long uh, to still retain the stiffness of short chain also. That, that was it. That was it. So we published that. We were very happy. So uh, we declare, we declare this uh, conflict between stiffness and the threshold is resolved by adding more resources to different kinds of chains. So, uh, all right, so that was that. So uh, um, uh, now this also shows that uh, uh, the threshold, threshold uh, scales with, um, there's a polyacrylamide chain or long chains, scale with a chain square root as predicted by Lake Thomas model. So this short chain play no role in terms of fatigue threshold. It doesn't matter. It's a, it's a threshold is determined entirely by the long chains. So yeah, over a quite large range, it's a quite good scaling. So we're very happy after this paper, we move on. <clears throat> yeah, double network hydrogels obey uh, the Lake Thomas model. So. So of course, the Jan Pingo is very happy. Ooh, her material not only have a high toughness, she was not engineer. So she thought high toughness is the only thing you need. We told him fatigue is also important. And by the way, your fatigue material 
raw material is also fatigue resistant issues. Very, very high. Yeah, okay. All right. And she actually last year won a polymer prize. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So she thanked me. <laughs> In her prize speech. All right. So uh, we did not damage her reputation. <laughs> we only damage our own reputation. So, all right. Now, uh, so we build on the story. Uh, I have another, uh, I have a, good, a really bright student, a uh, Korean student now, uh, faculty, uh, last year joined the um, uh, uh, Northwest. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the Tanglemer uh, come up. So uh, she, he was uh, uh, asking the question again. Uh, let's take a look at this picture. So I mentioned uh, city car and uh, rubber previously. Let's look at uh, closely what's going on. So silica, uh, when uh, crack, just window glass, silica. When crack going through silica, uh, you only need to break one layer of atomic bond. All the other atomic bonds remain elastic, no breaking, therefore, uh, the stress is highly concentrated to the atomic scale. So the stress concentration, that was a uh, Griffith's idea. Now, this idea is a Lake Thomas idea. Uh, when crack going through a polymer network, before the polymer chain break, it only only break one atomic bond, but before the polymer chain break, the entire chain is a stretch to the atomic energy level. When you break this chain, the energy of the entire chain is, is dissipated. Therefore, we say the polymer chain actually deconcentrates stress, deconcentrate uh, a bit more than just a single atomic bond, entire chain. Entire chain is, uh, could be 100,000, in our case, million. <laughs> Uh, uh, atomic bonds, right? That's the insight. Why you have this deconcentration? You have to look at detail. The deconcentration come from the following reason. Now here the concentration because here is atomic bond. We say stress is highly concentrated. Now if you look at a neighboring bond, neighboring bond, the uh, this atom transmit force into number of atoms. Each atom bond are covalent bond. So so if this force is a unit, then the neighboring will be a quarter or well, one third. And uh, there's an exponential decay, right? You just go out. You shear and shear and shear. And uh, by the time a few layer uh, away, the stress will be very low. But here in polymer, here is what's going on. The along the chain, you have a covalent bond as strong as this uh, covalent bond here. But in between the chain, in our case, just in between chain water. Even in elastomer, in between chain, you have a weak physical force, such as uh, Van Waals interaction. So that uh, there's no sharing of force. Your force is a primary transmitted along the chain. Between chain, the force is negligible. Remember, 1% or a few percent uh, as compared to covalent bond. So this weakness of interaction between chain that actually gave you the strength of the polymer. So that's the insight, right? This insight is a contained in a Lake Thomas model. All right, so uh, now let's go on. Uh, now, Tanglemer. Tanglemer, <clears throat> I already said, Tanglemer is a, a, is, a, is a polymer strand. Polymer strand is a strand between one cross link and another crosslink. So in between these two crosslinks, sometimes we can achieve 100 entanglements. I'll show you experimental evidence, how we count in number of entanglements, classical way to do this. All right, so now look at the, uh, the uh, so uh, compare the stiffness, uh, how you, when you stretch this material without breaking any chain. So here's the material, tanglemer. Uh, so if you don't break any chain, uh, both in uh, crosslink and entanglement 
are the stiffened network, right? So as a matter of fact, the entanglement is as good as, uh, as cross-linking. It's well-known, well-known in chemical, uh, uh, physical chemistry of a polymer. It's, it's well-known. That's good. So uh, now in particular, in particular, uh, if uh, in our case, because we have so many entanglements compared to cross-link, we have very long chains. Uh, so then the modulus, instead of a scale with a chain length, it actually scale with uh, a number of uh, repeat units between neighboring entanglements. So the scaling is not really, has nothing to do with the chain length entanglement. This is well known in, in polymer physics, nothing new. What is new is the following. If I look at a scission, uh, you need to break chain. Look at, so this is a cross link. This is entanglement. They behave differently. Now, for entanglement, the force, the high force can be transmitted uh, just along the entire chain. Because uh, we said between the chain, the interaction is very weak, right? So the high force, which is just transmitted. Uh, so other way to say this, this is a, uh, entanglement is just slip link, slip easily. It does not impede the deconcentration of high stress over length. So that's entanglement. Crosslink is different. So one crosslink, uh, you need to uh, link to maybe three or four other chains. So the high tension in this guy will be shared by uh, several more chains. Of course, <laughs> the force is lower. Then after a few more cross links, the force of other chains will be much lower than this chain. So then the strategy really is make chain as long as you can and, and or make uh, entanglements as dense as you can. And you have a brilliant material. You can, so again, two resources, even with the same polymer chains, two resources. Uh, one is uh, how many entanglements and entanglement, and the other is, are between cross links, how many repeating units n? These are two different ends. If you have a factor of 100, these two ends differ by factor of 100, right? Okay, so, so the rest of the thing, uh, I need to, so this is the principle. What I need to tell you, how you actually make entanglement. Entanglement is fantastic. How you make it, we find a few ways I'll tell you how we make it. Now we are, we'll get into the chemical engineering aspect, this is this problem. So, uh, so this is a brilliant student, Kim. Uh, Jinsu Kim, some people know uh, him. So he had an idea, he came to me, really, it was his idea, it was not my idea, his idea. He came to me, this is how we make uh, uh, this thing. Let's uh, first look at how regular people, people outside Harvard <laughs> would make hydrogen. Alan. <laughs> So regular hydrogel, because uh, we said hydrogel need to have 90% uh, uh, water, right? That's hydrogel, like tofu, 10% uh, polymer. So uh, hydrogel also often made from a monomer. And uh, so you polymerize, become a polymer. So this red dot is a cross-linker, cross -link, right? So if your end result is 90% uh, water, maybe you start also with 90% water, as a precursor, 90% water, 10% monomer, and then you uh, cross-link. So after cross-link, because this is a hydrogel, this hydrogel, uh, this is a polymer network, this is a precursor. So W is a water to monomer uh, molar ratio, or just a number ratio, uh, molecule monomer, uh, water molecule, this ratio is 25. It works about 90% water weight percent. Water. So that is a typical ratio. Now, for hydrogel, it's actually even worse because uh, most hydrogel application require is tissue engineering, required to be in contact with water. So when you have this uh, hydrogel freshly made, uh, more water will come in, the hydrogel will swell. Swell, then you have even more water. So that's why this material is so weak. And on top of that, you cannot have a lot of uh, entanglements. The chains are so far apart, they do not entangle. 
So this is his brilliant idea. How, how about I change W to be small? Uh, so his number is two. So he has a crowded, you know, he came from uh, Korea, everything's crowded. So let's, let's have a W equal to two. Uh, two water molecules and one monomer. Then, of course, the, when you polymerize uh, polymers all together, of course, you're entangled. So once you have a crosslink, this entanglement cannot detangle anymore. It's a topological. It's a permanent entanglement. And uh, then, of course, you cannot swell a lot because you have so much entanglement. Uh, water, you cannot have too much water molecule come in. So as a result, uh, you have much better material. You have lots more entanglement. That's for stiffness. And top of that, you can have a, as long chain as possible because stiffness is independent from chain lines anymore. Stiffness is set by entanglements. Entanglements is set by crowdedness, how crowding can make it, right? So that was his idea. So here, okay. So there's a, a highly entangled hydrogel look at a decent material. And then there's a regular hydrogel, so floppy because of too much water, and then, yeah, too, uh, yeah, too much water. All right, so uh, here's an interesting slide now. It's a measurement of stiffness modulus as a function of a cross-link, um, uh, cross-link uh, C. C is a number of a uh, cross-linker over monomer, which is uh, between two cross-link, how many monomers you have. So, and this is a number we can control. Now, for regular uh, thing, we said it's a, uh, uh, it's a W equal to, yeah. Uh, so it's a regular hydrogen look like this. The stiffness increase uh, with uh, crossing density because the regular material uh, stiffness is set by cross linkers. For highly entangled material, you can see when we change cross linker density by two orders of magnitude, modulus doesn't change. This is set by entanglements. So this uh, fact of 100 entanglements of a cross-linker is based on this evidence. We have too many entanglements. Okay, so and uh, then uh, we also measure fatigue uh, resistance. Yeah, it reached 200. It's a, it's a different. Uh, so this is actually just a single network hydrogel. For single network hydrogel, this material, the fatigue threshold is only 10. Now this is 200 enormous enhancement. So, uh, okay, let me uh, tell you another way of making this for, for people who like to work in kitchen. This is great. Tanglemer made by starting with polymers. Previously, tanglemer is made uh, by monomers. The way you make it is uh, to have a little bit of water, lots of monomers, crowded, you have entanglements. However, in many applications, so for example, natural rubber, you have pre-existing polymer you don't get to work with monomers. You have a long chain polymer coming from nature or coming from uh, the factory uh, because it's, it's so difficult to make a polymer. You don't make a polymer uh, in industrial or in your own lab. You need to have a dedicated, make long polymer and then you do cross linker uh, blending. So let's use this uh, natural rubber as an example. Everybody know uh, uh, natural rubber grow on tree, trees. Uh, so uh, this latex has a long chains to you have um, plus a lot of junk and input it a lot of water. So, and then you dry it out, you have this material, but this material is still very stretchable and also creeps because there's no cross link. Also, if you want to make a tire, you need to put uh, a carbon black in it. So you, you need to have this process uh, called mixing, mixing. So now you can see if you, you're already here, uh, there's a drying state, mixing is very hard. Uh, essentially people use a uh, blender, use, uh, you break chain, long chain to short chains. You damage the material. We want to have a long chain. We need to have a tanglemer. You violate our principle. No wonder for so many decades, you, you pr produce a sloppy material. It's not done by nature. It's done by you, <laughs> by cutting the chain. So we, uh, how, how do we do this? Uh, so that uh, we do a mixing and a cross-linking. 
without damaging the chain. So this is a chemical engineering problem, right? You already have one chain. So uh, we feel this is an important thing enough to do. Uh, so our work on natural rubber is still ongoing. Um, yeah, my students will be upset if I show the work on natural rubber. It's not published, but we have another material we have already published. There's another material people like to do uh, in bioengineering, PEG, poly, polyethylene glycol. I think that's it. Oh, PEG. So PEG, what people do is uh, uh, most lab cannot synthesize PEG from monomers. You buy PEG as powder, powder. So just like a flower, flower. So uh, then the traditional regular people outside Harvard, uh, universal, this is what people do. They uh, use the very short chains, very short chain, why? Because if you do a long chain, when you synthesize a hydrogel, it swells a lot and the material becomes terrible. So they use very short chains. Uh, that's powder. Uh, as uh, you dissolve this uh, short chain uh, the powder in water, it's a short chain solution. Then you cross link it, that's your hydrogen. That's how people do in, in, uh, outside Harvard. This is uh, what people do outside Harvard. So you have a, a, a yeah, start from this dissolution, uh, crossing and a swell, the final material. As a result, final, final material has very short chain, very stiff material, extremely brittle. I'll show you a number, extremely brittle, terrible material. Uh, so, uh, but a PEG is a material, a preferred material for its biomedical compatibility. But a mechanical property is terrible. It's actually worse than tofu. Yeah, it's a terrible material. All right, we say, okay, this is the primary target. We say, ah, oh, we know how to make long chains. So here's our idea. Uh, make it like a dough. So you, you put a flour, powder, right? Just mix it up with a little bit of water. Uh, so that uh, the amount of water is small, but uh, enough so that a chain become uh, 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 hy hydrated, just like a dough. You can knead it. We actually knead it. Knead it. My students need it. <laughs> My students need it. So after kneading, uh, so the initial polymer is a uh, is is a is a semi crystalline polymer. After water, little bit of water, it become a dough. Um, you knead it. The polymer chain uh, start to relax uh, because the amount of water is less. And also kneading is very gentle. You don't break the polymer chain. Just kneading gently. Uh, the polymer chain start to entangle. Uh, that's just a thermal motion. You, you, yeah, yeah. The, the student's hand, even graduate student's hand, this is a man, very large hand. They cannot knead, they cannot thread individual chain. Chain just uh, thread each other through thermal motion, through thermal motion. Mm -hmm. So, and then after um, the threading is uh, complete, we cross link it. Then all the entanglement is fixed. You cannot detangle. Right? And also you can have chain as long as you want. As you want. Yeah. So uh, this is how we make tanglemer. Then you subsequently you, you swell, put it in water. You first make a dough, cross link, and then throw it in water. You have uh, more water. So if you think about a noodle, this noodle can swell a little bit, but it does not become soup. It's, it's, it's a really stretchable, elastic noodle. All right. So, uh, so this shows, uh, okay, we, we, we actually need, we use a machine to knead it. Um, and use a machine. So a few cycles, this is a flour, uh, a dough, yeah, water and uh, powder did not, uh, uh, did not um, mix very well in n equal to one. But after n equal to seven, this thing become transparent. Yeah, uh, yeah, just a fold, compress, fold, compress seven times. It is uh, it's, uh, already fa uh, fairly good. Okay, so uh, yeah, now you can see the dramatic difference. This is just stress shrinker, stress shrinker. So the PEG synthesizer outside, outside Harvard is very stiff, but very, uh, this is strength, very low strength and cannot stretch a lot as expected because the chain is very short. 
And uh, since it's a harbor to look at this string curve, it's a routine. Yeah, we don't need to do something clever. It's just that. Don't, don't do it in kitchen. So, uh, all right. And uh, we uh, characterize it, but uh, yeah, many properties you can measure. But in particular, uh, I mentioned this a fatigue threshold for materials. Uh, yeah, let's not outside. Regular PEG, regular, be professional. Regular PEG. Uh, the fatigue threshold is only a joule per meter squared. So the number actually we measured. Uh, previous people didn't even bother to measure it. Just so low, this is very brittle. And uh, our material reached 100 joule per meter squared. Same chemistry, just architecture is different. Same chemistry. All right. So, and uh, now the last thing is uh, ah, this is uh, our recent nature paper entanglement reinforced by particles with particles. So here's a story. I don't know how you guys uh, follow this story. Uh, so of course, everybody knows the tire wear. And uh, this problem, uh, it was uh, just an economic problem. You need to change tires once in a while. So yeah, I don't know if people know, it is, uh, I uh, only learned this, uh, uh, learned this uh, a few years ago. Uh, it struck me as interesting. Wear of tire produces about one kilogram of a rubber particle on road per person, per year. I guess this is an important message for a university in Detroit. Uh -huh. So it's a, it's a, it's a time word, right? Uh, the wear is a problem. A few years ago, maybe, so I wrote a tweet about this kind of thing. Uh, we didn't do any original work. This tweet is uh, connecting the dots, uh, uh, several people. A few years ago, two or three years ago, three, four years ago, uh, there was a science paper made another discovery. This discovery was to address the following observation. The observation itself has been around for decades. So in certain part of the United States, the river, in the river, there were fish. And when there is a rainstorm, the fish die. <clears throat> So if you're a superstitious pe uh, person, uh, some numerology, <laughs> these guys did a scientific study. They, their hypothesis is uh, there's a rainstorm, the rubber particles on the road swept into the river and something inside a particle bleach out and the fish eat it. <clears throat> So then they tested this is a chemical engineer or chemistry group actually analyzed which, which ingredient leach out. It's a, a compound put in rubber particle for anti-oxidation. Uh, it's a rubber, uh, it has a double bond. Uh, uh, O2 from the environment will attack double bond and cause uh, environmental cracking. So for decades, it's known antioxidant was put in. These compounds fish eat will die. There's no, yeah, so there's no ambiguity. So that was established. So I saw this one, I jump up. Oh, we have enhanced the fatigue threshold by order magnitude. Can we also enhance where? Right? Because uh, for particle to form, polymer chains need to break, right? And also time needs to do many, many cycles. Must have something to do with fatigue. So that was how we got started with this project. Yeah, so uh, we end up not be able to make indent on where for the published paper published, but we discover another mechanism to enhance fatigue threshold. So that's we end up published. I already told you that, uh, um, uh, so, uh, oh, uh, so fatigue threshold for all these decades of its measurement is on the order 50 uh, joule per meter squared. Sometimes people report higher numbers. It wasn't understood. Uh, I think we, uh, we we understood better now, uh, but these are the number on the order of 100 joule per meter squared. Now, the people know when you put particle in, you can dramatically enhance modulus from one megapascal, maybe to 10, 20 megapascal. The mechanism is also known is a particle uh, uh, percolate so that they form a tree-like, uh, uh, string-like structure. 
Yeah, Anuda is a world expert on this kind of thing. I read her papers. Uh, yeah, cited many times. Highly cited paper I contributed from. <laughs> All right. So, however, people also know for people who study threshold measure, the particles, the conclusion is uh, particles markedly amplify stiffness, but not fatigue threshold. That was a conventional wisdom. Okay. So, and we accepted this in the beginning. But then we find a student who did experiment find our threshold is a thousand joule per meter squared. What, what did we do different? We did two things different. One thing, of course, our classical very long chain polymer. That's good. Very long chain polymer. This long chain polymer we already understand will enhance fatigue threshold maybe from fifty to two hundred. So you, we don't, we cannot really make chain too long. Our chain is not that long. So what, you have some, what's going on? So the other thing, different thing is, um, uh, so for carbon black, the chain, polymer chain and the particle are uh, interacting through physical bond. We made chemical bond, stronger bond, stronger bond. So as a result, as a result, here is another scale that a particle scale. So look, when there's a crack going along, uh, here's a rigid particle, our particle is a uh, silica particle, rigid particle. So before this um, uh, layer of polymer break, because this is a rigid particle, the adjacent polymer is also stretched. Could be, so because we have percolation, the polymer, uh, particles are clustered. So that instead of a relax, and it, you only need to break one atomic bond in one layer polymer, but many other bonds are stretched. When one bond break, the energy of many bonds actually is released. So we have this idea we call multi-scale stress deconcentration, two scales in this case. One scale is along polymer chains, it's a molecular scale. The other is a particle scale. They differ by factor 10. So, uh, so um, yeah, just to show you, we ma made this uh, highly clustered material. This is a fraction of um, uh, the, 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 the particle uh, in the composite. Uh, you can see particles nearly touching each other, highly crowded. It's a standard uh, volume fraction in, in car time. All right, so we can make that. And uh, we can, so you can see this is a material uh, threshold and a modulus. We can keep modulus almost doesn't change and um, and the threshold change by, uh, yeah, five to 10 difference. Actually, 20 to 20 difference from 50 to 1,000. All right, so, uh, so and it's understood. The mechanism was understood. So, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, actually, I, the video is only rubber is useful stuff. It's and made it by the journal. And reinforce it with the rigid particles. You can make it stiffer, which can be even more useful. Things like tires and belts and shock absorbers all need stiff rubber that can resist deformation. This material property is known as a high elastic modulus, while stretchier rubber would have a low modulus. It's easy to increase the elastic modulus by adding rigid particles, but what's harder is stopping stiff rubber cracking under repeated stress. The ability of a material to resist cracks under cyclical stress is known as its fatigue threshold. And the fatigue threshold of rubber has stayed the same for decades. But our team of researchers have created a new type of rubber with a fatigue threshold 10 times higher than before. Traditional reinforced rubbers or particle reinforced elastomers as they are known are made up of networks of rigid particles and cross-linked polymers. The cross-links effectively weld the polymer strands together. This makes the rubber stiffer, but also more brittle. This new rubber is a little different. 
It's still made of polymers and reinforced with added rigid particles, but the polymers are much longer with fewer crosslinks. Instead, these long strands are entangled with one another, like a bowl of spaghetti, with the remaining crosslinks locking this structure in place and stopping the polymers coming apart. There's a low friction between entangled polymers, which helps transmit any stress across the entire polymer chain. The stress can also be transmitted from the polymers to the rigid particles and from one rigid particle to another, all of which means that stress is no longer concentrated on a single point, such as the edge of a crack. The combination of long polymer chains and rigid particles work at different scales to amplify both the elastic modulus and the fatigue threshold. And that gives you a material that's stiff and which can take more stress without cracks forming or growing through multiple cycles. This development can have a huge impact for manufacturing all sorts of existing products, as well as in emerging fields like soft robotics. The researchers hope that this study could even lay the groundwork for rubber that never wears out opening an enormous space for material design and applications. Yeah. All right. So let me just summarize with one simple... This robot uh, has a lot of okay. features. Pneumatic fingertips. Yeah. All right. No robotic hand. Uh, so uh, let us uh, uh, do, do this uh, last page. Last page. Okay, uh, so yeah, it's in this stage is good enough. I just have one sentence summary. The tanglemer, I already told you what's a tanglemer, just a lot of entanglements, very few crosslinks. Uh, so, but it's consequent in mechanics, it's, it's deconcentrated stress can amplify fatigue threshold. This probably for decades had remained the same. Now we amplify orders of magnitude. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have time to take some questions. Very interesting talk. Actually, have two questions. So, at the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned there's a hydrogen at percent polymer or more than eighty percent of water. We have three companies compared to the traditional polymer. What does this water do in this material? In my opinion, like everything exists for some reason. This water, that like the hydrogen bond, the microscale also help you to improve that. And the second question is, uh, you also mentioned this like a dial making process, like uh, by improving the entanglement by changing the temperature, entanglement the formulation. So what does temperature change? affect the, the toughness of the material property of this your model? Very good question. And the first question was, uh, what's the role of water in hydrogel? So hydrogel, water, hydrogel uh, was uh, uh, mostly used as a bio uh, in tissue engineering. So water is there just like uh, your body is hydrogel. So you can say, ah, how uh, water in body, uh, what's the function? It's really transmit garbage and uh, nutrient. That's the function. Has uh, almost no mechanical function, almost no mechanical function. In our case, we just want to make a hydrogen because uh, uh, a lot of people in bioengineering want to have a better hydrogen. What about the like a hydrogen bond, like a secondary bond, hydrogen bond in the or uh, so to the first approximation, it's just like water. It doesn't really carry load. So to the first approximation, you can be more sophisticated. Uh, so uh, now your second question, second question, what was the second? It's the temperature. Oh, temperature. Uh, how does, yeah, entanglement. How do we densify entanglements? So I suppose uh, because uh, entanglements uh, is uh, also a thermodynamic property that depend on the side chain. If the polymer is more flexible, your entanglement uh, length is shorter. So for uh, common polymers, you can find a table. People actually measure entanglement density. 
So of course, being thermodynamic property, it will depend on temperature. I don't actually know or uh, how much you can change just because uh, the range of temperature you can change is very limited. So this is a one question. I keep asking my students, can you do something to densify entanglements such as uh, I develop small hands. <laughs> so you yeah, one entanglement per molecule. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know yet. So the temperature change, like uh, is the temperature change may be facilitated the entanglement formulation. Yeah. But, but can also defacilitate the entanglement formulation at the same time. It's depending on how you change the temperature. Sure. There are the temperature and the, your entanglement density decreases somehow after you already make that mix that material. Oh, oh. After, you, you... after the material is made, it's a cross link. You cannot detangle. There's cross link. It's like our thread. Our thread has uh, fasteners, so you cannot detangle anymore. So we want to make a, make like a thread. Our uh, our uh, cloth has a lot of entanglement, but this is uh, woven together. We have no molecular level feeding at this point. So entanglement uh, density is limited, right? But uh, once you have a fastener, you cannot detangle. You have to break chains. That's interesting. Yes, thank okay. you for the answer. Um, any other question? Yeah. Greg. Right. Yeah. Um, the question is uh, are there crystals in between that we talked about? And uh, it seems to me that these entanglements, if you want to make more, you can put in more crystals, especially chain for the crystal. So when they uh, unravel, you get more energy absorption. Mm -hmm. But you are doing that already. You say you're do, going to do a natural rubber. So I believe that if you simultaneously examine the material, that you're going to find a lot of interesting uh, results. Thank you. Yes, we actually are is a writing finishing writing a paper on are using natural rubber, yeah. long chain without uh, uh, in the field called a mastication, essentially cutting chains into short pieces. We make chains, uh, keep chains long and allow it to entangle, uh, entangle. So, so long chain, on top of that, as you said, natural rubber have a stress inducing entanglement. The toughness just enormous, so high we cannot even measure it. Just, a, just an order of magnitude higher than toughness reported in the literature. You can see that in your yeah. plot. Yeah, yeah. It, it goes yeah. way up. Yeah, way up. Yeah. We also, yeah. Crystallization going on. We also check crystallization by doing x ray. Uh, yeah, yeah. Crystallization. Uh, the long chain and entanglement also amplify the crystallinity mm -hmm. of the material. Yeah. Very good. It's, it's extraordinary. One more question. I had a kind of a similar question to Professor Yang. Um, I was wondering, like, what? So, um, in in your talk, you mentioned that the um, entanglements uh, increase the modules of stiffness without like uh, imparting additional like friction that the cross links do. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering what role like interpolymer interactions, such as like hydrogen bonding between polymers, or um, it like folded into uh, crystals or um, anything like that that are not necessarily covalent interactions. Um, I was wondering what how that would affect uh, these kinds of changes. Thank you very much. There's another paper coming out who examining the exact that question. <laughs> the question is the following: Instead of using cross links, perhaps we use uh, some hydrogen bond. Hydrogen bond is, is what we use. Hydrogen bond is not as strong as a covalent bond, but it clearly impede stress deconcentration, right? However, because of the hydrogen bond near the crack tip, the crack here, the hydrogen bond is still weaker than covalent bond. So we can actually unzip some hydrogen bond. So deconcentration is limited when you go far away from the crack, 
but it's uh, still allow substantial deconcentration just by unzipping them. This become another principle. If you want to create a material, uh, for example, you want to create thermoplastic material so that you don't want to have a covalent bonds because you want to shape it. You want to use a weaker bond, uh, you can. The principle applies. Uh, so we say the emphasis is you have inter the bond or crosslink of intermediate strength. Yeah, not too strong. If you're too strong, you're like a covalent bond. Uh, you cannot deconcentrate strength, but not too weak. If you're too weak, the material just uh, just a flow. It is hopeless, right? So intermediate. That's a principle. Uh, we 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 have a material system just demonstrates that. In that case, we achieve very high fatigue threshold, also simultaneous, very high modulus. Yeah, it's just a thermal, uh, a thermal uh, a TPO, thermal plastic elastomer kind of a work like that already. Because the people didn't articulate principles this way. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you.